Good evening everybody, Woodblock Printmaker David Ball speaking to you here from our shop in Asakusa, Tokyo. Welcome back and I apologize that it has been such a long time since our previous offering. This is going to be another in our series of David's Choice videos. You know the pattern. I take a print or prints from either my own personal collection or from our shop inventory here and I chat about why I think they are interesting or special. Tonight's episode is going to be something a little bit smaller than our usual choices. It fits in this little envelope. Now for most of us, when we think of Japanese ukiyo-e, we think of the famous single sheet prints, the ones depicting kabuki actors, beautiful women, travel scenes, the main themes of the genre. But producing those large prints wasn't actually the main business of most of the publishers back then. Woodblock printmaking was at heart the printing business. And as such, it covered everything from simple food wrappers, accounting ledgers, pamphlets, you name it, all kinds of printed matter, right up to and including those famous pictures that we know today. But over and above all these other things, the main business of Woodblock printmaking workshops back then was the production of books. Books of many, many types, but mostly novels like the one we're going to feature today. Now, before we talk about this book, this pair of books actually, I think it will be a good idea to open them up and browse some of the pages to give you a basic idea about what these books look like. Sometimes in these videos, you know, I tend to show too much of me talking, my face, and not enough of the actual prints themselves. So this time, let's start with the books, the content themselves. Let's go straight to the B-roll. The book is typical of a type common in the mid-1800s. They were most frequently sold in small paired volumes, as you see here, forming one episode of a very, very long series. This novel was called Hokusetsu Bidan Jidai Kagami, which is generally translated as um, Uplifting Tale of Northern Snow's Mirror of the Ages. <laughs> and it was published in serial form over a period of nearly 30 years, totally 48 episodes in all. The smaller red label here identifies this one as episode 21. And these two characters, upper and lower, signify what we would call part one and part two. Now the cover illustration flows right across the two volumes, and it's the only part of the book that's printed in full color. And this is quite a production, you know, they haven't spared any expense here. There's a huge number of impressions, many gradations. Look at this, some Nuno Mezuri, it's printing in imitation of actual fabric. And there's even front rubbing on the obi here to give it a polish. They clearly wanted people in the bookshop to reach out and pick this one up. Well, the books are bound at the spine with thin thread. This is a bit uh, aged, this one, and we'll talk a bit more about the binding system a bit later. Taking a look inside, we can see the general structure. Every spread has a large illustration depicting an episode from the story, and the text flows around the rest of the sheet, pretty much filling it up completely. <laughs> There's so much for the famous Japanese restraint and the love of empty space with uh, implied rather than in-your-face content. But we have to remember that this was not really high-class stuff at all. And actually, before I even do this, I can know there's going to be Japanese people who might see this video of mine and who will say, oh, why is Dave showing this junk to the rest of the world? Can't he find better examples of Japanese culture to show people? <laughs> well, I think that here on this YouTube channel, we do pretty well in that vein, and we can let our hair down now and then. Now, the populace in those days, and we're speaking of urban areas like Edo, was really quite literate, with estimates ranging up to about 80% of the population being able to read. Now, depending on the class level, ability to read complicated Japanese characters would have varied widely, but pretty much everybody could read the simpler cursive alphabets, and that's what you're seeing in these streams of lettering. It's a simplified script, accessible to a mass audience. And just as with our current forms of mass entertainment, much of it was over the top, everything but the kitchen sink action and drama. It's melodrama, really. The content was a melange of historical fiction and outright fiction, blending and blurring the real with the imagined, and it had heaping helpings of supernatural. It's also worth mentioning, you know, that although the text here isn't written using a lot of complicated characters, the forms and styling of even the simpler cursive script has changed quite a bit in the intervening years since this was published, and most modern Japanese, nor I, can no longer 
easily read these. Earlier in one of these videos, uh, I talked about the famous ukiyo-e quartet. It's the group of people who work together to produce all these prints. And the quartet was the publisher, the designer, the carving team, and the printing team, all working together to produce the final product. Now, for books like these, though, we need to add one more member to that ensemble. It becomes a quintet. We have the author. And that brings up the interesting question of how they got all these parts to fit together. Now, it seems to me that the method of working must have been something like this. The author presumably gets a draft of the manuscript ready, of course, working within the publisher's orders, perhaps going back and forth to get it worked out. And from experience, they know how many words they need for a typical volume. Now, as the author put the story together, he must have done so in a way to ensure that there was something in each segment of his manuscript that would serve as the source for the picture that would accompany that part. Now, whether the two men, the author and illustrator, worked hand in hand or simply on a handoff basis, we don't know. But given that the story had to be broken down into segments that would become these spreads, the designer would then get to work creating the illustration for each one. And we've seen how greedy the designers were, you know. Look, for almost every single spread, this designer, Kunisade, in the case of this book, he pretty much totally filled it with the image. This is totally different from the way the books were illustrated in the West, where illustrations in a book would typ typically be in some kind of like square box somewhere on the page. These guys just took the entire page as their canvas. Now, before we move on and talk about the text part of this, we have to look a bit deeper at how the illustrations progressed from concept up to final version. Now, the designer's drawing would never have been used as it is for the carver to work with. Men working in the publisher's place of business would take the designer's preparatory drawings, his sketches and better drawings, and get those ready for carving. Now, I don't have an exact example from this particular exact book, but I do have a research volume that talks about these points, and it's got some interesting illustrations from a few decades earlier. It was work done by the famous Katsushiko Hokusai. Now, these are going to show the kind of things that I mean. Let's take a look. First, look at this pair. What is clearly a preparatory drawing for a book illustration and the image as it later appeared in the published book. Now, the original drawing clearly shows the concept and the idea is quite fully worked out, but it was not ready for carving at this stage. To see how the transformation might have been made, let's look at another pair. This one is a preparatory drawing over here, and over here is the actual book page. Now, this one has been taken to a much more complete stage than the one I just showed you. And if I were assigned to carve this, I could actually do this. But look, see what's happened here. Hokusai has shown this fabric pattern only once. Yet, over here in the finished book, it appears many, many times. Now, this kind of work, cloning a pattern into the required locations, is exactly the sort of thing that could easily be done by any skilled draftsman in the publisher's office. Now, the result of those draftsmen's work, a tracing that will be passed on to the carving team, is shown by this interesting example from the huge collection in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Now, they have a stack, an absolute stack, of what are called hanshita. These are drawings at the final stage, totally ready for the carver. Now, it was very rare for such sheets to be preserved because, as a matter of course, these are destroyed in the carving process. They're pasted on the block and chopped into pieces. This group has only come down to us because the publishing project must have been cancelled at a very late stage in preparation. Look at the detail. Every little dot, dot, dot of the stonework, every last little pine needle, all the delicate kimono patterns, the, the borders done in straight lines. Was all this drawn carefully by Hoxha himself? No way. Not the slightest chance. This level of work just wasn't his job. He had turned in those preparatory sketches, got it done, and then got busy with his next work. The publisher's copyist would have taken care of all of this detail. Now, let's get back to our own book. We left off at the point where the copyists had done their work then, cleaning up the designer's sketches, drawing everything cleanly, and filling in all the details. And then, a specialist calligrapher would step up to the plate. He would have had the author's manuscript at hand, and on his desk would be the hunched sheet with a carefully prepared illustration and the bounding lines. Now his job, get the story written carefully into the remaining space. Now, here's a mock-up I've prepared of the same page of our book, using Photoshop to pull out the calligraphy to show what he would have started with. Now, Japanese in those days was, of course, always written top to bottom, right to left. So his starting point was defined. 
up there. His job, fill the leftover space with the story, getting as much stuff in there as he could, but of course, having it end up both carvable and readable. The finished page, you can see, he has literally filled up every possible space on this page. But how do you now read this? It isn't laid out in standard blocks of texts. We know where to start, up at the top right-hand corner, and we move along following the top to bottom, right to left rule. And then when we get to this point, where do we go? Down here? Over here? What do we do? Now look closely and you can see there's a real key to this puzzle. At the end of this text block, look there, there's a little funny symbol, two triangles. This is the key. We have to search around to find the match. And there it is. That's the next key. When I get to the end of that next block, there's another different symbol. Hunt around again and hunt around again and away you go, away you go, away you go. And finally, you get to the end of the page. I mean, forget the exciting and dynamic content of the story, just the process of reading is so much fun. This brings us to another very important point about these books. These were page turners, no mistake about it. Action packed, suspense filled, page after page after page. And then when you are right in the middle of the heaviest action, you keep turning pages, turning pages, you get to the bottom of one of them, and what does it say? Suzuku, to be continued later. Yeah! And that's, of course, the team of craftsmen. They were already busy writing and drawing and carving and printing the next pair in the series. And it would continue basically as long as people continued to buy them. They were hugely popular. There were dozens of publishers in Edo churning this stuff out, and it seems that the townspeople just couldn't get enough of them. They were distributed in various ways. They were sold right from the publisher shop. Publishers had actually bookshops themselves. They were sent out to bookshops in the provinces. They were even sold from people with backpacks of itinerant peddlers out in the areas without access to bookshops. And rental was a big part of the business model too. They would be dealers buying stacks of these books and then lending them out to their own customers. Now, there's a few more really interesting things I want to show you about these books, but I was kind of getting afraid about this getting a bit too long. But the recent feedback from viewers on that point has been pretty strong. So whatever, let's go for it. I'm going to take this book apart. Now I'll need to do this next part over to a different table so you'll be able to see what I'm doing. So let's pack up here for a minute and move over to our print party room where there's a wider bench that I can use for the surgery. When I show people this next part they are always really surprised because it just doesn't seem to make much sense. Let's open our book. Now here we go. Look at this spread with the illustration running across the entire visible face from far left to far right. But actually the left half of this and the right half were printed at different times from different woodblocks. Now why would they do such a thing? Now to properly understand this, what we're going to have to do is take this book apart for inspection. I'm going to cut up and pull apart all the strings here. Now don't panic please, now, this is not destroying this old book here. Back in the old days, the strings got old, the strings got torn, people would have done their own repairs. When we're finished with this presentation, I myself, I'll go back and, well I should have prepared a bit, bit of a pair of scissors here. Here we go. Here we go, let's get it all off. As I said, once we're finished here, I'll just sew it back up. We have had recently lots of practice at sewing books here at Moko Hong Kong. There we go. I think that's a different picture than I showed you a moment ago, but it doesn't matter. Here we go. Now, with the book taken apart, you can see how it's going to work. Let's open up some of these sheets. Slide this across. There's one side.
There's another one. We could open the whole book, as you can see. It just goes down, 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 down the line. Now, Japanese books of this type, they're printed only on one side of the paper. And we can see why. It was so super thin. If they tried to use both sides, it would have just been a total visual mess with the images showing through to the front side. They could only use one side of the paper. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, but that still doesn't explain why didn't they make this image here on one wood block and print it all at the same time? Couldn't they have done that and then bound it together? Well, there were sometimes Japanese prints, Japanese books made with that kind of binding. In fact, I showed one a few months ago on one of these David Choice videos, The Favorite Flowers of Japan. It's a woodblock print book that was printed this way. Each spread, it was text and image, but each spread was printed on one sheet of paper multiple blocks, of course. The next one was printed on one sheet of paper. As each one was done, they were folded inside like this. And then what they were done is they were glued at the edge to the neighboring sheets to finish up the structure of the book. Now, but these novels, with their cheap thin paper and their quick and cheap string binding, not the more complex glue binding with the heavier, more expensive paper, they needed the sheets to be folded the other way, inwards so that they could be sewn together at the spine. And because of that, let's open this up and look at it again. Because of that, the left side on one wood block here, the left side of this and the right side of that were cut and printed together. And on the next piece of wood, the right side of this and the left side of this were done and printed together. It seems like an absolutely a totally crazy way to make a book, but they were used to it. And if I hadn't pointed this out to you, you would probably never have realized that what you're looking at is two different woodblock prints, perhaps printed by different people and even perhaps carved by different people. But there is a hugely interesting epilogue to add to this story. And to tell you about it, I have to repeat one of the most enduring semi-myths about Japanese ukiyo-e prints first arrived in Europe. We've all heard the story and it gets told again and again and again. This afternoon, I went to a Google search for this and printed off some examples. Here we are. Let's see. Ukiyo-e was used to wrap lacquerware, pottery, and porcelain that were exported overseas. Japan was awash with ukiyo-e in the mid-19th century, and discarded prints frequently became packing material for ceramics and other items destined for Europe. Ukiyo-e became so old-fashioned that the prints, now virtually worthless, were used as packaging materials. The graphic artist Brachimon discovered drawings by Hokusai on paper packing in a box of Japanese ceramics. And it is in that last example that we see the germ of the reality behind this semi-mythical story. Now indeed, ukiyo-e wasn't inherently valued in Japan at that time, but the Japanese did know that Westerners wanted the prints, and they would not have discarded them so carelessly. The image we get here of beautiful Utamaro prints or the great wave being scrunched up to wrap teacups is simply not true. Now, what did actually happen? Okay, now remember, back in that period, just as with many Western societies at the time, there was no such thing as garbage in the modern sense of oh, this thing has been all used up, so let's throw it away. That wasn't how society worked. Such a thing as a kimono, for example, would be worn then transformed and recut into some other type of clothing, then eventually transformed again and again until maybe in the case of that, that fabric, it got down to cloth scraps for wiping the floor or something. Then maybe even those scraps would be used as a filler for padded clothing. And then maybe finally even having the threads pulled and reused. They didn't have the terms reuse and recycle like we do, but they certainly knew how to do that. And so it was with these little books. They were produced in vast quantities, you know. They were read from cover to cover again and again, passed around and read from cover to cover, read again and again. Excuse me, I'm trying to get ready for the next little setup here. <laughs> and all the time, the fingers were rubbing against the soft paper, turning each page, rubbing again, turning each page. Now, the washi they were made of wasn't the finest and strongest type. As time went by, of course, the pages became to become worn and tattered. At some point, the pages of any book became just so smudged and beaten up, they became unreadable. And here we are. Look at this. A little stack of torn, smudged, and discarded Japanese book pages. 
Now, I got these from my friend, the book dealer, Wade Asan. He deals in little books like the kind we've been looking at, and we have an assortment of them actually in our shop in inventory here. But he has to purchase bulk, lots sometimes, with all kinds of things mixed together. And so he ends up with stuff like this. Toss them in the trash. Remember, there was no trash, and you can see where we are leading with this thing. This is the kind of ukiyo-e that was used to wrap the teacups and other items being sent to Europe. Worn out, totally destroyed, distressed book pages like this. I don't need a whole lot of imagination to understand what would have happened at the other end when the shipping crates were opened. I'm sure they were excited about the teacups they were receiving, but as we can all understand, they would have been intensely interested in these little scraps of torn and smudged wrapping paper. So there we have it. It's a little overview of a not so well known part of Japanese culture. I have mixed feelings about these little books, you know. I've been a reader all my life, and I have to confess I find it a bit frustrating to hold one of these in my hands and not be able to read it. It seems so interesting and exciting. As I mentioned earlier, though, the ability to read modern Japanese doesn't help with these things, as the style has changed so much in the intervening years. But perhaps it won't be too long now until our AI overlords develop the ability to read and translate these things for us. And until that time, together with you, I'll just have to sit and relax and enjoy the pictures. Now, thanks for coming with me tonight on this exploration, and I'll see you next time. I hope it won't be too long. Good night for now. Thank you again.